So hello and welcome along to another edition of Isolation Interviews for Hospital Radio and my YouTube channel. And I'm very excited to be joined by the cinnaman, Paul Sinner from The Chase. How are you, Paul? I'm very, very well. I did something unusual last night and I went to bed at eight in the evening. And I woke up this morning at eight in the morning. So I've had 12 hours sleep and I'm feeling significantly better for it. I was going to say, it's always good to have a, a, nice, uh, a nice sleep. I sometimes find that you know, even if you have like long periods of sleep, it, you end up waking up more tired. But then at the same time, you can have days when you sort of feel on top of the world. Uh, now, well, I, was, I, totally agree, I totally agree with you, but your best bet is to get loads of sleep. Statistically, that's your best shot. Now, obviously, we find ourselves in another lockdown, lockdown three. For you, how have you found the many stages of lockdown and, and you know, the kind of restrictions? How, how are you finding it all? Well, it's a bit like the Terminator films, isn't it? The, the first lockdown one was really thrilling and original and presented ch all sorts of challenges. Uh, lockdown two was quite dramatic. And now I'm bored. <laughs> I'm bored out of my mind. Um, and um, I mean, I didn't really know where I was going with that analogy, but it sort of seems to end okay at the end. Um, it's really hard to summarise. It's really hard to be pithy and go, well, la, 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 la especially as every lockdown was different. I don't even remember lockdown too particularly, other than stay away from people. And the reason I absolutely had to stay away from people as much as anything else was because I'd been booked to do Beat the Chases and TV Showdown. And um, I was going to end up losing an awful lot of money if I'd picked up any, any hint of COVID in the meantime. Uh, lockdown one was one of the most dramatic periods of my life because I've got COVID. I was one of the early... I was one of the early lots. I was in the papers against my will. I was quite ill. Um, I lost a very good friend to COVID during the time that I was ill with it. Uh, the tabloids were covering my every move or simultaneously covering episodes of The Chase that were on repeat from 2015 and 2016 and episodes of Beat the Chaser that were from January. It was all going on. Various bits of the tabloids were covering my every move and it was a really, really tough time. And I don't think I'm necessarily particularly fully recovered. I feel that uh, I've still got remnants of lockdown one coursing through me. Um, it's, it was crushingly disappointing to lose all your comedic work, live comedic, and not all, I've done bits and bobs and some of it quite memorable. During those little gaps between the lockdown, I had some really nice gigs and the thing is, as a comedian, as a chaser, as somebody with Parkinson's, as somebody who's politically active and, and also writes jokes for a living, I want self-expression. I want the ability to say whatever I like and people go, hello, well, that's interesting, whatever. And I lost so much self-expression from having my uh, stand-up career almost wiped out in one fell swoop. Um, but also having the tabloids tracking my every move uh, and realising I had to be really, really careful about what I said uh, because I tweeted a tribute to my uh, uh, late friend and the next thing I know, the tabloids were running the headlines, Cinnaman's friend dies of COVID-19. And that wasn't a great feeling. It must be so tough when obviously, you know, you're going through it yourself and yet you've constantly got, sort of people it feels like looking over you and and like the like the tabloid press you know people that are kind of always wanting a piece of you and you must get to the point where you're just like i just need a bit of time to myself uh well exactly and i was pretty much ordered to have time to myself by my my, my management team because i wanted to fight the tabloids because i don't think i think it's important that people fight the tabloids um but it would turn out that's not a healthy thing to do i mean i remember reading somebody on some forums call me a effing idiot for not having, I, I, when I said that I probably got COVID, I said it would appear that I didn't isolate in time. Well, that's the definition of having COVID, isn't it? That's all I'm saying, is if you've got COVID, you didn't isolate in time. The moves I made to make sure that myself, my family, my relatives, everybody knew the seriousness of the situation uh, and, uh, and got to isolate could not have been any stronger. The fact that I was using Twitter to tell people to follow medical advice and isolate could not have been any stronger. 
but I had a couple of gigs um, before lockdown kicked in that I did and probably picked up COVID at one point or another. And that was it. I was actually one of the people telling everyone to isolate, 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 isolate. But before I was doing that, I just had a professional career. And at some point, I must have picked it up. And so when I see a stranger online going, what an effing idiot, he's a problem, la, la, la. It's like, no, you're the problem because you're too stupid to, to realise there's a lot more complexity to what you're reading in a tabloid paper than you might imagine. So I've got all of this going on. And so basically I ended up retreating into the world of online quizzing. And I've said this in a number of interviews, online quizzing has performed a miracle in that the competitions that we used to take part in have grown exponentially. So I'm now taking part in about seven in a week. Uh, today's an unusual day. I've only got the one quiz. Um, yes, you know, it's grown so much because uh, quizzing is full of people with online technical skills and organisation that can suddenly just set up a big competition. And I counted up what I was doing in a calendar week. And I think from a linguistic barrier, we don't quiz much with the French, Belgians, Germans, Finns. But in the English speaking world, I've quizzed with everybody this year. And by everybody, I mean, I don't think there's a single major quizzer in the English speaking world who hasn't been on my computer screen uh, at, at some stage since March last year, which is quite, you know, it's quite a thing. And so that's kept me sane. It's given me an intellectual, uh, an intellectual impetus to go, keep going, keep going, keep going, learn stuff. Because what also happened is in the first two or three months of lockdown, I just kind of lost touch with the world. All I cared about was my mum, my dad, my family, my friends. I didn't really follow what was going on. And quiz has helped me reconnect by going, this is what you need to know. This is what you need to know. I remember swearing my head off going, who the devil is Tiger King? And why do I need to know about him? Well, I know who he is now. Um, a lot of the years been playing catch up and trying to work out. Because a lot of people have had no drama no emotional drama in the pandemic at all. They just got on with it. I envy those people. But I've had all sorts of drama. It's not, it's, you know, it's not just for my own health, but the health of my family and the health of my friends. And I've always tried to be there for them. And part of being there for them is, is, is sacrificing your engagement with the, with the outside world a little bit. I mean, that's the amazing thing with technology nowadays is, I mean, you know, even five years ago, something like a, a, a Zoom quiz or a Skype quiz probably wouldn't have happened. So the fact that we can do these things now where we can connect with people, see their faces and, you know, whether it's, you know, chatting with family, doing, you know, quizzes online with friends, relatives, it, it, it's a great thing, a tool that we've now got. Um, so, I mean, I imagine for you as well, it, 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 it kind of helps do more with other people, especially in this time we find ourselves in i mean i'm a great i'm not tech savvy i'm a great believer in technology uh, what i mean by that is the reason it exists is to improve how we live our lives that's the very reason it exists and people don't use it enough um people don't use it just enough to just say hello there was one morning where i just got i just said my zoom room's open and a friend of mine who lives in western australia and a friend of mine who lives in North Yorkshire came into the into the Zoom room. We just had a chat about the NHS. They didn't. These two didn't know each other, but they knew me, and um, just had a chat about the NHS. And that was it. It was really nice. My fiftieth birthday was amazing. I invited about eighty select people, and basically every ten minutes, I'd randomise the Zoom room and stick five of them in a totally different Zoom room each time. And it was an unusual way to run a party. But it was really, really good fun. There are things you can do. There's an originality of thought. So certainly that's true with quizzing, but it doesn't have to be just quizzing. Uh, technology allows you to connect with people. My, my motto for a number of years has been loneliness is a choice. Uh, we're now so interconnected that nobody has to be lonely. If you want to play a game of bridge, go and look up online bridge, bridge clubs, uh, bridge this, bridge that, and you'll find resources. I, mean, I haven't double checked this, I've used bridge as an example, but you will find resources as to uh, how to communicate with people that share your interests. 
in the various online quiz leagues that I've played this year, I've made loads of new friends, people that I'd never heard of, let alone met beforehand, that I feel that even though I've not really met them now, they feel like really good mates and really close friends. It's Technology must be embraced. If you're um, just going to be old fashioned, you know, oh, 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 Zoom isn't real life. Well, nothing is real life. But if you use Zoom well, sometimes it's better than real life. Um, uh, and online quizzing is one of those examples. For me, there's no doubt that from a quizzing point of view, online quizzing is more fun than real quizzing. And as well, the fact that, you know, we can't go out and see people at the moment. So it does give you that contact and, and it just gives you that kind of purpose. Because some people who, you know, who are, who are on their own at the moment, you know, they've got nothing, not, they might not have anything else to, to keep them going, whereas they can connect with people on Zoom or, you know, Skype or whatever um, and, and, and talk to people and, and have conversations. I have people, I mean, I host some quizzes. I have people turning up that just wanted to chat and say hello. They weren't that interested in quizzes, but... They want to get that to access the opportunity to say hello. Um, I think that, yeah, loneliness is definitely a choice. Now, we must, of course, talk a bit about the chase because, you know, for you, you've been a part of that show for, for so long now. I mean, where, when, how did it first come about for you? How did you first become involved in the show? I was sitting in a hotel room in Mumbai in the beginning of January 2011 when I switched on my Facebook and Mark Labette sent me a message saying, that they're looking for a fourth chaser. And back in the day before the internet, I never used to apply for anything. Because the whole idea of the sticking things in envelopes and getting a stamp and sending it was just more than I could possibly be bothered to do. But these days, when you're just an email away, um, I just send them an email going, I'm a stand-up comedian, um, currently ranked in the top 20 of the British quizzing circuit. Here are the results of uh, the 2009 World Quizzing Championship, where you can see that I beat Mark. And here are the results of the 2010 World Quizzing Championship, where you can see that I beat Anne. They showed interest, sent me for auditions, a slightly choppy process, until they gave me auditions with former contestants. So that it was much more real, rather than people on the team. And when they gave me auditions with former contestants, that's when it all started coming alive in terms of trying to be entertaining and funny at the same time. And I got the job and the rest, I suppose, is history, really. And of course, from that, you know, the show Beat the Chasers has come about. And I mean, I really love Beat the Chasers. I think it's a fantastic concept, so quick, because um, obviously, you know, you've got contestants coming out quite quickly. And then there's the, the obviously the fact that all, all five of you chasers get to work together. So it must be nice to actually do a show where you're all together, because normally in the normal shows, it will just be one of you on, on the show. Yes, indeed. And uh, it's not easy because we're now in the position the contestants are on a normal show. Well, we have to make decisions as to who buzzes in and who guesses. I mean, I can't tell you the degree to which not enough people have worked out what's the dramatic moment of the show. The dramatic moment of the show is when they ask us a question and none of us know the answer. And that's when the egos come into play. Who's going to press and get it wrong uh, and risk someone going, I was just about to press that and get it right. Or risk someone on Twitter going, oh, I can't believe he buzzed that and got it wrong. That's the great selfless skill. Is the, is the underrated skill is buzzing in and getting something wrong so that we can all move on to the next question. If somebody, if Bradley says, what's the capital of, of France? All five of us will jump for that buzzer to try and say uh, Paris. It doesn't matter who gets there. That's not the important bit. It doesn't matter who gets there. It's not important to the game. If, he's, if he then says, who's the patron saint of Central African Republic, that's when the drama starts. Because that clock is running down and running down and running down, and we're making decisions to which of us is going to buzz in and get it wrong. Because also, uh, you're, you're not just thinking about who, um, you know, who's going to buzz in first, but it's also trying to work, you know, you're, you're trying to answer the question, but it's trying to work out, oh, well, this might be a, a mark question, or this might be a question that Anne will get right. So you're also having to think, you know, I hold off. The important thing is working out, is, is this your question? It's not so much, um, is it a mark or Anne question? Is, is this your question? I have, if I hear the words Coronation Street, unless they're going to say William Roach, I'm not going to buzz in really. 
and but but that's because Jenny knows the Coronation Street questions inside out. But if Jenny's not playing, I'm still not going to buzz in because I think that uh, I just don't know the answer. I won't know the answer. So it's a question of knowing what you're doing with. But you'll see on at least two or three occasions, them ask us a question, and none of us knew who to buzz in, and we lost valuable time. And then the drama is there's only sixty seconds. We don't, we don't we we have time to make one mistake. If we make two, we're in all sorts of trouble. So when they first pitched the idea of beat the chasers um, to you guys, what what was your reaction to it? I mean, w w did you did you kind of see their their thought process? Were you excited for the project? I mean, honestly, it took us a long time to come up with a, a format that worked. That every we had lots of uh, audition sessions, and um, it never quite worked for ages. And so we were as shocked as anyone when they said, we've got a new version of it. Would you like to try it out? And when we did, it was all right. And I thought, who did this? Uh, and they won't, you know, they won't admit that we probably made as many good suggestions as, as they did as to how it might work. Um, so I, 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 it was relief and surprise, as much as anything else, that they finally found a format that was going to work, because we all wanted the spin-off more money, more prime, prime time viewers. We all wanted this bit off, we wanted it to be good. And I think that's what's great about it is it's good. And also the, the other thing that I think works really well, and I was you know, talking to, to both Sean and Anne about this, that I think it works so well because they do it over the course of a week. So you don't have to wait a whole week for the next episode. It's night course, after yeah. night. And it's, it's, I think it makes the show a lot quicker as well. I, I hate the, we'll find out tomorrow thing as much as anybody else. I mean, I just want my uh, my results over and done with on the first day. Don't want to wait till tomorrow. So yeah, I, I, I like that fact that it's all over a week. It enables there to be a little bit of a narrative. Mark apologising to Sean for having had a go at him earlier in the week, that sort of thing. There is a there is an episode where, you know, Jenny punched me because I went in on a Star Wars question. Did anyone spot three days later there was a Star Wars question and I just went like <laughs> I just sat at the back of the seat. It was all part, part, of, the, part of the narrative. I love Be The Chasers. I love taking part in it. I love, every, I love everything about it. And also, because, the, I was going to say... The only thing I don't love about it is that they create tabloid stories instead of going, oh, they're playing very well. I think that's the thing is that the media will try and paint you guys as if you don't get on, but you are like a family. I mean, I imagine you're all very close in real life. It's a lovely, lovely thought. We know each other. <laughs> um, I, I, we know each other. We respect each other. We get on with each other. We're loyal to each other. Um, but, we, but within that within that focus, there are people that are big closer friends than others. Uh, and Je but ironically, the one who's comfortably my closest friend is Jenny. And it doesn't sound like it. But when she punched me, it was a mark of respect. She punched me because she knew that I knew that I should have known better than to buzz in on a Star Wars question that I didn't know. She would never do, she would never do that to somebody that she didn't know as, as well. Me and Jenny have known each other for donkey's years, got drunk together for donkey's years, been to the same parties and quiz after quiz things and been, enjoyed each other's company abroad. Um, I, I couldn't get on with Jenny any more than I do. So it was interesting to see the tabloids. I mean, I don't know if you saw on Twitter, but I showed a load of photographs of me and Jenny getting drunk together over the years, including her singing at my wedding. Now, she sang at my wedding. Not only did she sing at my wedding, but she got one day's notice. I gave her 24 hours and said, Jenny, you wouldn't mind singing at my wedding, would you? And that was two weeks after uh, X Factor had finished. And so she, went, she had every excuse to go, really, I can't be bothered. And she, she was there. Um, so this idea that uh, we don't get on is, is ludicrous. And I mean, of course, having a, a host like Bradley on the show, he just, you know, I mean, so many people love him on that show. He works so well for, for the chase. Um, I mean, you guys must love working with him as well. Yeah, but we're not as close as you'd think. I mean, we're, we're, there's respect. But the fact of the matter is that Bradley's a workaholic work machine. He hasn't got time to hang out with us after and go, hello, hello, hello everybody, it's my round. We, we don't, unless we're actually the same award ceremony, which is very rarely, we don't hang out, but he's 
We have, I've got his number. He's the most famous person whose number I've got. And when I won the British Championships in 2019, within 20 minutes, he'd send me a text message going, congratulations, mate. And I was like, that meant a lot, a lot to me. Um, so, but, so we all get on, yeah. And of course, you know, having, you know, uh, comedy background, I mean, it must be, it must be nice to kind of work with, with people who, who, you know, you know, are, are, you know funny themselves. I mean, obviously you, uh, you know, get to do the comedy circuits. I believe you've done a few uh, quizzes in, in the Reading area as well, or a few uh, like sort of stand-up gigs. I was in succession a few years ago, but I re- all I really remember is crashing my car on the way to one, uh, in a, a, some sort of beer keller type beer. Have you got some sort of a beer festival? Uh, yeah, so that'll probably be, I can't remember the name of it now, but yeah, it's, it tends um, to be in the, the sort of... The massive weather in the middle of town as well. Uh, I, was, I, I hosted a quiz there. I've been to Reading a lot uh, over the years, um, whether it was the old Jonglers or um, South Street Arts, the wonderful South Street Arts Centre, I must stress. I've been, I've been to Reading quite a lot over the years. Now, also, you've got a new project which has been going out over the past few weeks, which is the TV showdown. So, tell us a bit about that and how did that come about? Because it's a bit, it's obviously, you know, different to, to what people will know you for. Um, I can't give you all the answers, to be honest with you, because I don't know. I just, it's, Dame Fortune was flying, was choosing where to shoot its arrow and shot it at me. Um, and sometime in late autumn, I mean, to give you an idea of how quickly. This will happen. I'm pretty sure that in September I'd never heard a TV showdown, uh, and by December I was hosting it. So it all it all happened in a bit of a blur, and I think that anyone who gets angry and is going to judge us negatively must understand that we had the uh, rug pulled from under so ma- so many occasions because it was lockdown. And it was locked down, then not locked down, then locked down, then not locked down, then locked down, then not locked down. We didn't know what was going on from one week to the other in terms of the availability of people to come on the show. Um, exactly. We, we, we had to, I say we, of course, I'm not a producer, but every week I was being told something different about this, what sort of show is going to be. <coughs> and you know what? We did our bloody best. Uh, with um, with celebrities that some of whom hadn't had any work for months. Um, in one case, Janet Street Porter on Janet Street Porter on Saturday had come directly for the record from Loose Women. She'd just done, and in my case, I recorded all of those shows two days after finishing Beat the Chasers. It went Beat the Chasers day off um, TV showdown. So, and in December, in during a lockdown. When it's freezing cold and in temporary studios i think we did really well and i hope we get another series uh, in order to allow the show to breathe a little bit more outside of a lockdown um i mean the, the other thing is that uh, because we were under on, on, in such a hurry we just had to there wasn't as many shows available to us to show clips of because it takes quite a while to get the rights for this all sorted out. And um, I mean, the, the, the great thing for you is it must be nice doing different projects, different sort of things to kind of, you know, stretch your, your, your sort of, you know, your performing muscles and all that. It's nice to do something a bit different to the, from the chase or something. Well, I think the thing is I've gone from veteran to beginner in one fell swoop. And, um, you know, with the chase, I know exactly what I'm doing. Suddenly I'm presenting. I'm not just presenting, I'm presenting a show where some of them are people that I know and some of them are people I'm slightly intimidated by because I've always known them and I've never met them. And it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a different dynamic. Some of them are people that love being on the show because they really like a quiz about TV. Some of them are people who are only there because they're there because they've been asked and they're going to be there. It's a real variety pot. And what you get is an edited, edited product. Uh, you don't get the bits that sunk disastrously or sometimes the bits that triumphed but can't be shown on TV for whatever reason. <laughs> Let's just call it whatever reason. <laughs> I mean, did you find yourself getting starstruck by anyone that you, you met doing well, that I show? I think, in honesty, Martin Kemp. Uh, Martin Kemp is on a future episode. And with, with me, I get starstruck by people that I knew when I was a teenager. Um, so Martin Kemp will be the one. 
Now, obviously, going forward, you know, hopefully we're going to see another series of, you know, Beat the Chaser because it was thoroughly enjoyed. And also, hopefully, there'll be more from uh, the TV showdown. But, I mean, is there anything else you want to do going forward? Any, any sort of, like, dream projects you'd love to work on? Well, I'm five or six chapters into an autobiography called One Sinner Lifetime. One Sinner Lifetime. Um, and I would like to finish that book, and I'd like to publish it. Interesting, because mine is, is, an, is, a, is an amazing story, uh, as far as I'm concerned. In, in, the, in a 12 month period in 2019, I got married, won the award for the best com foreign comedian at the New Zealand Comedy Festival, got diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, and won the British Quiz Championships. Uh, that's no, nobody has a year like, 20, like I had 2019, and I think it's going to make a really good autobiography. Um, so I think the dream project is to get an autobiography published. Now, I just want to say, Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you for giving up your time. Um, but before we go, is there any messages you'd like to give to anyone who is listening in hospital at the moment or to the amazing NHS staff that are out there? Um, yeah, the message is, if I'm, if I'm going to say it's going to get better, then I'll be lying because I just don't know. But we all have to assume it's going to get better because there's no other way to live your life. There's no other way to live your life other than to grab and try and, try and work out a plan by which you can grab life and try and make the most of this horrible situation that we find ourselves in. Our only real option is to be, be positive. When people say to me, why are you so positive? It's like, number one, you don't see me privately. Uh, and number two, uh, because I have no option. I don't want to spend my life miserable. Uh, what, what, who, who would want to do that? I'm going to enjoy it. Anyway, I just want to say again, thank you for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Of course, keep safe and uh, hopefully we'll speak again soon. Thank you very much, Matthew. It's very kind.